Welcome back to another video. I know usually on this channel we focus on Utah Jazz content and a couple other teams, but today I wanted to take a special moment to appreciate the greatness and quite possibly the best Olympics that I've ever seen in my lifetime and that we may ever see to be quite honest. With that being said, it's your boy Wraith Hoops. If you're new to the channel, go ahead and drop a like, subscribe, turn on post notifications. I drop a video about every day, so why not? With that being said, today we're going to be talking about how they won, the most important pieces, and then the outlook going forward. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into this one. As we know, in the Olympics, the United States team, known as the Avengers, anointed by LeBron James and the rest of the cast, or I guess the media teams first and then them, uh, took home the gold medal over France, interestingly enough. Actually, both the men's and women's teams took home gold against France, which is the first time that it's ever happened where two of the same country's teams face off against each other in the final. With that said, they played against Serbia and started out really rough. They got down early. They ended up locking some things in. I'm not really sure why certain things ended up playing out the way that they did as far as lineups went and matchups per se, but uh, they got sorted out eventually. And with a couple strong runs and the assistance of Stephen Curry finally waking up along with LeBron James consistency and lastly, obviously, Kevin Durant can't leave him out being the clutch score that he is where not only was he being a great scorer, but when you take away all the other responsibilities and tell him just to get a bucket, he's going to give you a bucket. And then defensively, something that a lot of people are finally starting to cue into is how rangy he actually was. It was one of the most impressive performances defensively I've ever seen him have in his career, just because the floor, obviously the three-point line is a lot closer to the rim. And by a lot, it's not that much distance wise, but it makes a difference when you're shooting. And for that reason, the floor is shrunk. But when you take into account the fact that he's literally seven foot doing the things that he does on that side of the ball, you just have to appreciate it because he allowed them to have a level of switchability that they didn't previously had. LeBron James was holding his own at age 39 against uh, the alleged best player in the world in Nikola Jokic. You also had Anthony Davis on the floor. You had Bam Adebayo on the floor. You had Kevin Durant on the floor. All these guys were dealing with a lot of switch action in the second half because in the first half, they tried to make that move, but in a lot of situations, they had guys like Drew Holiday. And while he is pretty stocky for a guard, he's still a guard. And against the best player in the world, it doesn't end up playing out that sweet. So being able to have that switchability and have all those bodies to throw at him and LeBron James holding up surprisingly as well as he did, it just allowed for them to get back in the game. Obviously, some difficult shots were made. You had the likes of Stephen Curry, the LeBron James, and I said Kevin Durant putting a couple daggers in there, and they were able to pull that one out 95 to 91. In the final against France, quite honestly, this was one of the this is the best, and maybe it's recency bias, but it is for myself personally, the best international game I've ever had the ability to watch because we saw some of the best players in the world, a rising star in Victor Webb and Yama go head to head in the home field advantage for France. The stadium was electric. Everything about it, even the broadcast team was pretty solid, which tells you something because we always don't get that these days. In that same vein, though, there was a lot of glaring issues that we saw at times, uh, starting with Joel Embiid's just lack of fit with the team overall. Now, Joel did kind of pick up his pacing. He was a little bit inconsistent defensively against Serbia, but he had a couple good switches. He had a couple good stands against France. I did not think he should have started. And when he did start, it showed very obviously why he was not the guy for the job at the very least in the beginning. It was nice that Kerr gave him the opportunity, but I don't think the opportunity should have never been put on the table to begin with because that's what allowed the game to be just playable in the first half when it shouldn't have been for France to stay in the game. Wemby's quicker, despite Rudy Gobert's inability to stay on the court for a substantial period of time, he's also at times quicker than Joel Embiid, and he also has that same length that Wemby has with the ability to protect the rim. So in that vein, Joel Embiid just wasn't a great matchup. AD was obviously particularly better, but even then, Wemby was doing his thing and he really, really, really looked good. Oh my goodness. When the Spurs decide to be a competitive team, I'm hoping it's this year. They have Chris Paul, they have Stefan Castle, they have Wemby, they have Vassell, they have Sohan, they have all these pieces. They have Barnes now, even though he's old. I just really like what's going on there. And if this Wemby, if international Wemby shows up day one, mm, 
the NBA is in for a treat. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're gonna talk a little bit about the numbers. I'm going to do a light briefing over it this time around. If you go to my other channel, and I'll have it linked in the description below, it's literally called The Other Wraith Hoops. I know, creative as hell. But if you go to that channel, you'll see a longer video where I'm talking about both games and everybody's numbers, what I felt about everybody specifically, but I'm just trying to gloss over it since this is the channel that most people that watch my content do catch me on. And I felt like it was worthy of it because of how great the games were. With that said, Stephen Curry got hot both of these games. He ended up having a 30 and a 20 ball. And after really just not really being a no-show per se, because he was having and commanding a lot of gravity, doing a lot of the extra stuff that shooters have to do when they're you know, unable to hit their shots, he finally came alive the last two games and helped put the series away. And while a lot of people will feel as if, oh, Stephen Curry deserved the MVP award, LeBron James was by and large the most consistent player across the entire thing, leading the team in all categories of points, rebounds, and assists. He just did his job and then some. But Stephen Curry definitely would not we wouldn't have won without Steph doing what he did in these past two games. Similarly, Kevin Durant was a very big piece, and without him, you question whether those games were winnable either. Anthony Davis, especially. Joel Embiid, you can kind of brush to the side. He did have a couple good games, but it wasn't the most necessary, I suppose, when you look at the other performances from his teammates. So you had Stephen Curry leading the team with 14.8 points. You had LeBron with 14.2, Kevin Durant with 13.8. From the rebounds perspective, you had LeBron with 6.8, AD with 6.7, and surprisingly enough, Jason Tatum with 5.3. He was rebounding, but he couldn't shoot. More on that later. LeBron led the team with assists, 8.5. Second was Drew Holiday with 3.6. And Devin Booker, who I have a newfound respect for, with 3.3. More on that later. Now, Stephen Curry, obviously, with his almost 15 points, three rebounds, two and a half assists, he shot 50% from the field and 47.8% from three-point range. And it's literally the last two games that catered it that way because the first three at least for this sample size, because we're just going to focus on some of the later exhibition ones and then his initial game that led previous to the Serbian game. But he was not hitting. In pool play, he was not hitting. He was shooting pretty bad, 25% from three as a matter of fact. But he lit absolutely nuclear from three-point range and from the field to the point where in the final, when it was a one possession game after a Wimby three, I believe, Wimby's bucket made it a three point game. The US, correct me if I'm wrong, had 82, France had 79. And Curry said, no, 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 US might've had 81, 81 or 82. But either way, Curry rattles off four straight threes. The last dagger, sidestep off the left foot with Evan Fournier and Nick Batum doubling him. You've seen the graphic, I know you have, where Kevin Durant's over there at the top of the key and LeBron's on the left wing and they both have their hands up calling for the ball. And admittedly, Kevin Durant kept kicking the ball back to Curry because he was the high hand, but they're both wide open with their hands up just as an option. Curry sidestep off left leg, heave, it went in. And the game was over. And honestly, Curry would have ended the game on a 12-0 run with the exception of eventually D-Book getting a go-ahead pass from LeBron for LeBron's final assist of the tournament as he had a breakaway layup that ended up effectively closing everything out and making it a 11-point game to close out FIBA play. With that said, though, we have to appreciate Curry for what it was worth. He did his thing to the max. LeBron James, 14.2 points, 6.8 rebounds, 8.5 assists, led in two of those three categories. If not for Curry going absolutely nuclear in the last two games when we needed it most, LeBron would have led in all three categories. He shot surprisingly not too hot from three-point range after pool play, but it was okay. He was 30.8% from three. Overall, he was 66% from the field. So he understood what he needed to do. He needed to attack downhill, finish at the rim. And that's honestly what he did. We saw that he didn't really have the same lift and just bounce that he's had in years past, but the man's darn near 40 years old. So the fact that he was still able to barrel his way down the rim, get enough lift and finesse the number of reverse layups and just same side, same hand finishes, and offhand finishes that he had was uncanny. It was something It was something that I wasn't really expecting, um, but he got it done. And I just, that's what the greatest players in the world do at the end of the day. Kevin Durant, we learned, well, kind of learned, but understood that he is the best version of himself 
when you strip away all the extra responsibilities and tell him to go get a bucket. When you don't expect him to leave, when you don't expect him to do all these extra things, you don't require him to play with me. You don't require him to rebound. Admittedly, he did okay in both categories. He had 3.2 rebounds. He had 2.3 assists. If you tell him just to get a bucket, there were games where other teams would have LeBron James sub out the floor general of the team. Mind you, sorry, by the way, I, I'm a LeBron James Glazer at times, but he did have four turnovers. The shrinking of the floor did a lot to this man. I saw back to back to back turnovers in the final game and I actually got concerned at one point. But shout out to Curry because nobody's going to talk about it. Everybody's going to talk about how great Curry did, but nobody's going to talk about that three to four minute stint where LeBron turned the ball over like three times. Nevertheless, that's not what this is about. We're glazing him today. Anyways, Kevin Durant shot 51.9% from three point range. He shot 54% from the field overall. He shot 93% from the free throw line, almost 94%. It was 0.8. The man was hitting on all cylinders. At one point in this game against Serbia, MB tries to set him a screen. He waves off the screen. MB goes by, his defender goes by. He proceeds to slide left, snatch back to the middle, hit the midi. The man guarding him had no chance. He had no chance and we knew it was coming. That was the thing. As soon as he waved off the screen, we knew it was time for Kevin M. F. and Durant to go nuclear. And just like the storybooks and all the things did, all they predicted, all they foretold, he got the job done. Shout out to Kevin Durant. And the craziest thing that I think a lot of people are really enjoying about the Olympics or did enjoy about the Olympics now that they've concluded and we have time to process is the fact that we got to root for everybody. It now wasn't a thing of, oh, you're a Lakers fan, so you hate Steph Curry. Oh, you're salty about how Kevin Durant left OKC and joined the Warriors. It wasn't, oh, we're Devin Booker haters. It was, we're American. Ooh, I love being American watching these games. I never felt more patriotic in my life, except when other teams were, you know, other US teams were playing. Except for, I'm not going to put him on blast. But needless to say, the NBA does house the uh, world champions. Officially now, by the way. But Anthony Edwards was solid. The last two games were a little bit rocky for him. When you saw zone looks from Serbia specifically, and then even going forward, it showed that he was not the greatest at navigating them because his jumper did eventually cool off. It wasn't the greatest. And he did cut down on the overall number of shots that he took. But he did have one really solid game that we needed out of him getting, I believe he had a 20 ball in that one. If memory serves me right, it was like 26 points. Definitely did what he needed to do when it was necessary. Defensively, he was off the charts per usual. He actually ended up uh, with 1.3 steals per game. So that was tied with only LeBron James for the most on the team. And third behind them was actually Anthony Davis, ironically enough. So AD was very solid, but Anthony Edwards had 12.8 points, 2.8 rebounds, and 1.2 assists. He shot 48% from three, 58% from the field, and we're not going to talk about the free throws because he had a very small sample size, but it was 58.3%. Okay. I love the energy that he had. I'm, I have a different outlook on AE than most people do. I believe that he's a couple years away from taking that next step. When he becomes a more competent playmaker for other people around him, he will be a genuine problem. We will be talking about one of the greatest shooting guards to play the game of basketball in the NBA ever. And I think he's going to be the face of the league at some point. And if not, at the very least, he will be the face of Team USA basketball each and every summer because the guy can flat out play and it's bar none. He's just literally him at times. And he was one of those big growth points. He needs to show a little bit more improvement, but I overall love what I saw from him. Just to skim through the rest of the guys who I was really impressed with, uh, Devin Booker, y'all know I don't like the Suns. Y'all know the Suns fans don't like me. But I have to give Devin Booker credit where credit is due. He is a role player through and through. He is not necessarily the leader of a championship team, but my goodness, can he fit a freaking role in a closing lineup with D book in there? I didn't see that coming. 11.7 points, 2.7 rebounds, 3.3 assists. The man shot 56.5% from three point range, 56.8% from the field. He is the reason why Jason Tatum did not play. Cause you're not playing Le you're not playing jt over lebron or kevin durant so who does that leave anthony edwards who i already said shot 58 percent from the field 48 percent from three-point range and d book who i just said 56 56 78 and played great defense 
Like when I tell you great defense, I mean picking up 94 feet, picking up from full court, half court, whatever it required, switching, call, calling out communications, just getting the job done in a way I've never seen him move before. And I really, really, really loved watching this version of D-Book. If he could translate this to the season, I might have to eat some words and be a little bit of a D-Book glazer, not gonna lie. Joel Embiid, 11.2 points, 3.8 rebounds, 1.4 assists he shot 54.5 percent on limited three-point attempts and 56.8 percent from the field overall he wasn't terrible but the team usa play style does not really suit him he's a very strong jab step jab step try and draw a foul baiting a little bit uh he did learn his lesson a little bit later on as he realized they were not just going to give him calls like the nba he struggled a little bit, and I don't think that he should play for Team USA. I know he's been talking about going back to Cameroon, maybe playing for France, something else. I think that would be very beneficial for him because it can be a more him-centric type of system as opposed to him being a cog in the machine because he does not really work out very well, and I don't think that he's going to work out very well going into this next season with Maxi, PG, and company alongside him because I think this is a very big growth point. Hopefully he takes this information to push himself forward instead of going backwards, but really only time will tell if I'm gonna be quite honest with you. As I said, Anthony Davis was the better out of the two. He had 8.3 points, 6.7 rebounds, two assists. He shot 50% from three point range on limited attempts and then 62.5% from the field. He also ended up putting together 1.2 steals and half a block. Correction, he had half a turnover and 1.5 blocks. That He led the team in blocks. Yeah, Embiid had one per game though, so shout out Embiid for that. I really loved Anthony Davis. I loved the fit. I loved the fact that I could see AD, Bam Adebayo, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Steph Curry, those guys all sharing the floor at different times. And I think it really sucks for KD and Devin Booker because they got so spoiled. They had... Anthony Davis, Bam Adebayo, when Joel was having very good spurts of play, they had those three guys running their five. And they're going to go into regular season and have use of Nurkic for 82 games. <laughs> and that sucks. But I digress. Drew Holiday, very savvy veteran, 34 years of age, 7.6 points, 1.8 rebounds, 3.6 assists. He was there. He was out there. 50% from three-point range. He also was 55.6% from the field. He filled in a lot of gaps. He did a lot of hustle plays. He played hard-nosed defense. Drew was everything that a glue player needed to be for this roster, similarly to one Derek White. Bam out of bio, six points, 3.7 rebounds, 1.3 assists, shooting 33% from three. There was a couple games where he hit some bangers from outside that arc. From the field, he was 53.3%. I expect him to take this into next season. If he can shoot, I know he can dribble. A lot of people don't recognize how well he can dribble. I know he can dribble. He just hasn't really had three pointers in his bag. So the fact that he was comfortable and expected to shoot these, especially from the corner, I think that that would be a big step forward for the Heat, even though they don't have a really overconfident or over capable team this upcoming season. Derek White being the role player that he was, 3.8 points, 1.4 rebounds, 1.6 assists. He shot 30.8% from three-point range, 41.2% from the field. Not overall great offensively. Defensively, though, he was every bit of a hustle player that he needed to be fighting over screens, closing out, switching th between three and four people in a possession. He was as hard-nosed as they come, and honestly, him and Drew Holiday were a very deserving duo, I will say. Tyrese Halliburton, again, didn't play that many minutes, or any of that many games, honestly, but 2.7 points, 0.7 assists. He was 50% from three-point range, 60% from the field. He was okay. Apparently, he had a minor leg injury that limited his time. I don't know how true that is, but that's what they're saying. He got an MRI for it and everything. But he seemed to be a good spirit about the fact that, you know, he got the gold medal with putting in minimal effort for that A on the project, as he posted on IG. But I think Tyrese Halliburton just didn't really fit things too great, just considering how he doesn't really fit defensively. I'm not going to call him a cone, but he doesn't really have the girth and build to stand up with a lot of guys that is necessary. But he will eventually get better as time goes on, I personally believe. Looking at towards the elephant in the room, we have Jason Tatum, 5.3 points, 5.3 rebounds, 1.5 assists. He shot 0% from three-point range and 38.1% from the field. The reason why JT didn't play, defensively, he was competent, right? Rebounding wise, he was obviously competent, right? He was third on the team. He couldn't shoot worth a lick. I believe the number was totaled at 16 total jumpers that he missed. He missed every single one of them. All his makes were lays. They're point blank at the rim. 
a dunk or a dunk or a lay. That's all he got. So it wasn't though that he didn't get the opportunity to show something. He did. But when there's this many great players, everybody else plays really good and you play piss poor, you can't play. Like I said, he, you're not going to play him over LeBron James or Kevin Durant. You weren't going to play him over Anthony Edwards with his percentages. You weren't going to play him over Devin Booker with his percentages, especially when you haven't hit a three. He wasn't taking five and six a game. I recognize that. But if you're missing two and three threes every single game, I'm not going to be able to play you every time. If you have a midi and you miss the midi, you have another midi, you miss the midi, you have a floater, you miss the floater. These shots pile up. And there's only but so many shots to go around for each individual person. So if somebody's on the chopping block and these two players, player A and player B, are playing above what we expected them to, and they're on a bubble right now, I'm going to keep playing them because you're deflated. You're not hitting. It's not going. Uh, his mother going on social media saying that she needs an explanation for it. And, you know, all the brands and hoop pages all just hyping it up over the top. And then hit JT posting on his IG story, some effect of like, you know, free JT or we're, we're going to get back for JT was definitely something that I was not expecting. But hey, it happened. Um, it was the polar opposite of Tyrese Halliburton. And honestly, it gave me a newfound respect for Devin Booker because he played the dog out of his every possession that he had. And he showed me a side of him that I previously thought, honestly, you switch the roles. I thought Jason Tatum was the alpha and Devin Booker was going to get left to the wayside because I, I'm not going to say I'm a Devin Booker hater, but I'm a little bit of a Devin Booker hater up until watching these games because D-Book was over the top, just flat out one of the best role players on the roster. It's hard to be a really good guy and be that guy on your respective team and then come out and say, yeah, I'll come out here and do the dirty work. Yeah, I'll come out here and die for a loose ball. Yeah, I'm going to spot up in the corner. I'm going to play hard nose defense. And I'm going to go right over here to this left, this left corner and I'll stand there ready for the kick out. Like that's hard to do. And a lot of guys are unwilling to put in that work, but he did. This was a great showing from Team USA. I loved what I got to see. Stephen Curry, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, their probably last hurrah, just really showing us everything that we could have wanted. And then some Victor Wembanyama going literally berserko in that final game, dropping a 20 ball of his own, not letting France go out until Curry absolutely said, this is it for you. Your time has come. And the rest of the world got to see what everybody in the United States has been watching Stephen Curry do to people for the past better part of a decade, just absolutely frying dudes from beyond the arc with you playing literally smothering defense. And he, it's a hundred percent contested. There's it's basically impossible, but he is the greatest shooter of all time for a reason. LeBron James is arguably, if not clearly at the very least in my eyes, the greatest basketball player of all time. And Kevin Durant, arguably one of the best scorers of all time. I believe that this was one of those things where it was the greatest version of the Olympics that we'll ever get to see because the U.S. was still firmly the favorite. There were a lot of teams that could hang with them. There were a lot of teams that felt like they were going to be capable of standing on their own and getting the job done. But at the end of the day, we still trusted in Stephen Curry, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, D-Book, AD, all these guys to get the job done for the U.S., you had a lot of teams like Serbia, you had teams like France, you had teams for like Puerto Rico, who actually was not the worst team possible. You had South Sudan step up. There were all these different great teams and you see the overall talent across the globe just slowly rising to the point where they're right behind us. And this was the last time we're going to see a very firm victory where even when things get rocky, you still trust us to take the game home. LeBron James probably won't be here four years from now. Curry probably won't be here four years from now. KD won't be here four years from now. Drew Holiday will be 38. He probably won't be here. Derek White at 34 probably won't be a good hustle player. AD is going to be 35. Do you trust him to still be there? Joel Embiid is not going to be there, of course. So we're really going to be banking on some of the young guys to take that next step forward. And most of our generational pieces, your Luka Doncic, your Jokic, your Wembenyama, all those guys are overseas. They're not playing for Team USA. So it'd be interesting to see how the league progresses going forward. I'm looking interestingly to see how Anthony Edwards develops, hoping to see a couple guys like your Chet Holmgrens, maybe depending on how Cooper Flag develops himself as well and Ace Bailey's. There's a couple other guys in this upcoming draft class that I think will have a couple years to figure themselves out. And if they are genuinely those type of generational talents, they'll be able to step up and throw their name in the hat as well. But for better or for worse, 
I think this is as peak as Olympic basketball gets if you're a USA fan, because this had a little bit of everything. Everybody feasted except for Jason Tatum. And I'm sure Tyrese Halliburton was having the time of his life, especially if he did actually have an in injury to his ankle. He'll be 28, so he'll definitely play a bigger role next time around because he will be needed. And as long as he bulks up, he puts a little bit more weight on his frame and he can absorb contact a little bit more because the games have been more physical and the refs were letting those guys play. I think that he'll definitely have a high impact role the next time things roll around. But I know I talked you guys ear off. I hope that it was at least somewhat entertaining, somewhat informative. Let me know what you thought about the Olympics below. Let me know where you think things are going. Who's going to be a surprising player, I guess, next time around four years from now that you would like to see how they perform? Do you think that the U.S. will still be the favorite next time around? And if not, who do you have taking home the gold? With that being said, as always, it's your boy Ray Thoops. Thanks for joining this video. Go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, turn on post notifications, become a member or drop a donation to help support the content. With that being said, good morning, good evening, and good night. No matter where you're on the globe watching, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.